and then I'm gonna let everybody in. All right, let's see. Admit all, here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna just wait a couple of minutes and let some folks start uh, coming in. Um, hopefully when you came in, you should have heard the recording notification. Uh, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the housekeeping, but uh, hopefully everybody is hearing that notification when you come in from the waiting room. Hi, everybody. We'll just give it another minute or so. Yeah, That's another minute or two. Three minutes. That's what I feel like is three minutes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> All right. <laughs> a, th a three minute window after the st the actual start time is when I, I feel like we hit critical mass. Zoom time is different time. Zoom time <laughs> is different time. I do miss travel time though. You, you remember like scheduling <laughs> that in your calendar where you're like, oh, I need 30 minutes travel time, yeah. 45 minutes. And then it was a nice time to chat with folks, get a coffee snack you know very snack legs. <laughs> now you're lucky if you get five minutes in between your zoom meetings so i know i think that's where that three minutes comes in because people have to go grab a <laughs> beverage or something from their net their last meeting it was like bio brig beverage time <laughs> that's when starbucks made all their money off of us <laughs> All right. Well, um, so keeping uh, with Diane's three minute rule, um, let's go ahead and get started for the folks that are here. And as, as folks join, I'll let them in from the waiting room. Um, but good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jennifer Lee Anderson. I'm a board member of the ASPA Cascade chapter. Um, and for those of you who don't know, ASPA being the American Society for Public Administration. And we are the chapter that covers the state of Oregon and Southwest Washington. That is our region. Um, so we have a, a lot of a lot of ground that we cover, but um, you know, we try to, to hit on topics that will be important and interesting for folks, you know, from the whole region. Um, and we definitely think we, we hit the mark today. Day, um, with with our colleague who's going to be um, talking about local election officials and the challenges that they face. Very, very topical. Um, and I know his head is right in it because of the, the nature of the research that he's doing at this very moment. So he's, he's very excited to talk to us. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things um, that I just wanted to say right off the top before I hand it over um, to our MC for the day. Um, first, as you heard when you came in from the waiting room, we are recording today's session. Um, so if you would prefer just to keep your video off, um, um, and, and mute yourself unless you're asking a question, by all means, feel free to do that. Um, although uh, the plan, of course, is to either have um, his slide showing um, or I'll, I'll also pin um, Dr. Manson up there so he can kind of be the, the main um, uh, in speaker view. So primarily, it'll probably just be him in the slides, but um, it's probably best for those of you who are concerned to just um, keep your video in, uh, off um, if you're concerned about that. Um, closed captioning, um, you should have that option for show captions if you're on a computer. I can see the option um, right here at the bottom in my toolbar on my screen. Um, unfortunately, I don't know where that option shows up if you're on a mobile device, but I'm sure it is there somewhere and it should be called show captions. Um, the AI isn't always perfect, but it's usually pretty good. So um, if you do need captions, please uh, do avail yourself of them. Um, questions, there'll be kind of a, a sounds like a couple of different opportunities for questions to kind of naturally come up in the course of the presentation. And of course, we'll also have a Q&A at the very end. Um, if you want to type any questions um, directly into the chat, feel free to do that. Um, the chat um, is blocked so that only um, uh, the host and co-hosts can see it. So you'll type it in, but you won't see other people responding to that because only we can see it. Uh, but don't worry, we're getting them. We're seeing the questions uh, and we, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and uh, see when there is either a good time to, to fit that into the presentation presentation time or uh, pop it at the end um, during the, the general Q&A at the very end. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I think I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our chapter president, Diane O'Day, to uh, take it from here. 
Hi, everybody. Welcome to our annual event that we that ASPA Cascade hosts um, in order to educate the community at, uh, more broadly about a topic. Today, we are absolutely thrilled to host one of our very own ASPA Cascade members, Dr. Paul Manson. Um, Paul Manson was uh, kind enough to provide me with a bio, so I will read that. Um, it does not do him justice on how excellent of a person he is, but we will try. Um, Paul Manson is the research director at the Elections and Voting Information Center at Reed College. He is also a visiting assistant professor of political science at Reed College. Since 2018, Paul has led a national survey with his team at uh, the Elections Voting Information Center that explores the challenges facing election administrators across the United States. In his research on elections, Paul is particularly interested in the personal stories of election administrators. What draws individuals to serve as election administrators? What motivates them to serve the public in this increasingly challenging environment? Paul will share some of the insights today, as well as an overview of elections administration. Prior to joining EVIC and Reed College, Paul was a researcher for the Center for Public Service at Portland State University. And Paul holds an MPA and PhD in public affairs and policy, also from Portland State University. And uh, he is thrilled to be a member of the Cascade chapter of ASPA. I did not, Paul not pay Paul to say that, but we are also thrilled that Paul is a member. So welcome, Paul, and uh, feel free to take it away. Sweet. Thanks so much. And yeah, absolutely. We have to plug the chapter, right? You know, make sure you get that membership set. Um, thank you both. I'm happy to be here. This is, uh, I was just sharing before we started the um, conference call here. Um, this month, a colleague and I are in a neat project. We're interviewing every election clerk, every clerk in Oregon. And so this is just sort of flowing through my mind right now. It's what I eat, sleep, and drink, and I love it. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll start the slides here, but as um, our host mentioned, feel free. Uh, I've got some sort of natural pauses the way I've organized this talk, and I'm happy to take questions midway, especially because the way I've structured this is to try to do a little elections 101 on administration and then slide into some of the research on local election officials themselves. So um, feel free. I think we're also a good-sized group. Um, it's easy to sort of pause and have those conversations. All right. So the talk is titled Buffeted by Many Storms. It's it's a, a nod to the fact that it really seems like since 2016, but really going back to 2000 in many ways, um, election administration in the United States has faced a number of unique and constantly evolving challenges. Unfortunately, those have probably accelerated uh, in the past four years. Uh, when I started uh, election administration research, it was really centered around the concerns around cybersecurity and outside interference with the election system. Um, and it just seems like every year there's a new national or international level challenge that local election officials face. Uh, and so uh, this spurred a, a series of research questions to try to understand how are these, uh, um, who we, we term the stewards of democracy, but they're local public administrators. How do they manage these stresses and face these challenges? Uh, and then there's some also additional research questions around sort of who's drawn to the profession and, and what does it mean for them in part to understand the resilience of that workforce and of that community. Just a little bit about the Elections and Information uh, Voting Center. Uh, we call ourselves EVIC. Uh, we are in a little house over on the Reed campus. Uh, I had to find a picture of spring, right? We've turned the corner, the days are longer. So I thought, let's start thinking about spring a little bit. Uh, we have a number of projects that we run. Um, probably the most important one and the one I'll be drawing from a lot today is what we call the Local Election Official Survey. This is a national survey we've administered almost every year since 2018. We took a pause in 2021 as we were sort of reorienting out of the pandemic. Uh, we also conduct national and statewide public opinion polling, um, often around voter perceptions and voter confidence concerns. Uh, and then some election audit work we've supported, and I'll share some of that uh, in the talk today. We started out, uh, EVIC uh, was founded by Paul Gronke, who's a colleague in pol uh, political science with me at Reed, uh, in 2000, focused on vote by mail or vote at home. Um, and that's really shifted uh, as we've seen sort of innovation across the election space, whether it's online voter registration, automatic voter registration, uh, updates on how uh, voting happens in the US. And it's really changed quite a lot. So my goals for today, and I'm excited we have a, you know, a nice chunk of time here together, 
um, I wanted to share a little bit about what is election administration about. Um, and in part, uh, I want to lure some of you in to join me on this quest, right, to understand what goes on in election administration. Second, uh, I'll talk a bit about who are the stewards of democracy, this term we use for local election officials. Uh, it's a unique group of actors who really make democracy work, make elections work, and also maintain the relationship with voters that's so critical for legitimacy. Uh, then I'll shift and talk a little about how they're doing. Uh, we have seen enormous stressors, enormous events in recent years. And so I've got some data here to share about that experience for them. And then we'll quickly sort of look ahead and see what are some of the challenges for 2024. I think all of us are sort of, 2022 was a test. Uh, and I think we all came out of it really happy with how 2022 went. 2024 is going to be a next level sort of event. So uh, we don't know entirely what to expect, but we want to be ready for that. And lastly, as I've hinted, my fifth goal here is to help you become election nerds with me, hopefully. Uh, this is a, 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 a nod to a great podcast. If you're interested in election administration, uh, high turnout, wide margins, uh, great podcast interviewing local election officials. So if, if today gets you excited, uh, go find that podcast, email me, let's get connected. Uh, we need more election nerds, both in the research and practice space. So. Let me start out with um, a little overview of election administration. And I will put a little warning on this that one of the challenges in the US is uh, it's very diverse. Election administration, the laws, the practices, the technologies um, are sometimes called a crazy quilt or a tapestry. Uh, and that's because we administer elections at the local level in the US and you see a lot of variation then across local governments. But let me share sort of in general what that structure is. And there's sort of a life cycle here, right? From voter registration, maintaining voter rolls, the election or election day events, and election day has become something different over time, and in the back end of reporting and audits that occur within elections. To give you a sense, one of the challenges as a researcher I have is that we administer elections so differently state by state. Uh, the um, NCSL slide here, just sharing the difference in structures of who oversees elections. Um, there are between 8,000 to 10,000 local election officials in the U.S. The reason that there's a variance there is that how we define who administers election varies. Uh, for Paul Gronk and I, our work at EVIC, we tend to focus on the individual who has election day responsibilities. And what that means is that in some districts or in some jurisdictions, you may see an election official who's in charge of everything that is the lead up to the election. Uh, that might just be ballot design, printing and preparation along with voter registration. And then another individual who then administers the election on the day of and following up and does the tabulation. Sometimes they're unified, sometimes they're boards. Sometimes, and this is a great research challenge, there are two people because it's a bipartisan pairing. Uh, and so this makes the research work really interesting because it's, it's hard to figure out who you want to really speak to. The other challenge is, of course, each state has different sets of rules and expectations. Um, you know, this is a key reminder that uh, the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, um, really puts all the power for election administration on the states. Um, Section 4 does allow for Congress to set the time, place, and manner for federal elections, but otherwise, it's really up to states to develop the systems that they want to have in place for elections across the board. And even within Oregon, right, we see this variation, some counties adopting different uh, tools or innovations at different rates than others. Uh, it makes for a very interesting series of research challenges. The other piece that sort of dovetails on that, um, in some jurisdictions, uh, states such as Oregon, uh, counties are the administrative unit for elections. In other places, they're townships, notably Michigan, Wisconsin. But even states like Texas and in the states in New England, where you have lots of very small counties, means that we have a hard time understanding what to study. We call this a sort of 75-8 problem in our world, which means that 8% of those jurisdictions and their chief local election official, the administrator in that jurisdiction, are essentially representing or serving 75% of voters in the US. Uh, meanwhile, 75% of local election officials are in these very small jurisdictions. They only serve about 8.5% of the electorate. Uh, and for us, there's an interesting challenge here. When you survey a group like this, how do you handle this difference between a very small group that cover many voters, but then at the same time, many small jurisdictions that are also equally important? Even here within Oregon, we see a large variation between, let's say, Multnomah County and then Wheeler County, right? Very large differences in uh, registered voters. And so 
where do we go to listen to pain points? Where do we go to hear the stories of what's happening in local election administration? And I'll share a little bit about this in the next section where we get into some of those details. Um, the U.S. is also unique in the sense that we have a very bottom-up system, and it's very decentralized. Uh, it's interesting. I, I always enjoy when I visit colleagues in other countries, you know, being an election nerd, one of the first things I often end up talking to them about is, what is voting like in your country? Uh, invariably, you know, I talk to a friend from Mexico or from France, and they pull out a national ID card, uh, and that is tied to their election system, or they might have a national voter ID card. Uh, and this is something that we for politically, political culture reasons, history, lots of institutional reasons, is not an option in the United States. Uh, we don't have national identification systems. And so that means that we then also have to work with um, a very mobile population and try to manage registration uh, in unique ways. So in the US right now, we do see a lot of innovation and variation in terms of what that voter registration experience looks like. Uh, for all of us here in Oregon, right, we're excited about the fact that uh, we have a particular form of automatic voter registration that we think is pretty uh, effective in gaining uh, new enfranchisement of new voters. Uh, when I first started working in this space, online voter registration was sort of the new hot thing. You can see here that we're essentially seeing that spread across the U.S. for the most part, 42 states plus D.C. and Guam. Uh, two more states are in the process of ramping that up. Same with automatic voter registration. We've really seen that grow quickly. Right now, 22 states, also the District of Columbia, um, I'll note on here, even automatic voter registration is not the same everywhere, and it depends on the agencies they work with. Usually this is a Department of Motor Vehicles DMV engagement. Some states vary that a little bit. Um, Alaska, where I grew up originally, also connects it to their permanent fund dividend program, uh, which is a revenue sharing program for citizens up there from oil royalties. AVR, automatic voter registration, also varies in terms of what's called the back end versus front end. Uh, front end systems are much more common. Uh, and what that looks like is you go to the DMV to renew uh, your driver's license and you're offered an opportunity to update registration or register to vote. So um, it's definitely a more aggressive, you know, it's, it's a more assertive way to include people in the electorate, uh, but it's essentially an opt in at the beginning. Back end systems, which we use in Oregon, presume at your DMV transaction that you do want to register to vote. And you'll get a follow up postcard later on saying, if you want to opt out here, this is the formula for a lot to do that. Uh, backend systems mean that we add a lot of people. Uh, notably in Oregon, and this was an interesting challenge in our recent governor's race because we were trying to read tea leaves around polling. Um, the biggest group of voters by sort of partisan affiliation is now non-affiliated voters, NAV. So non-affiliated voters are individuals who have been registered through the DMV transaction. Um, but of course, we don't automatically assume anything about party affiliation. That's another part of what that postcard does. Um, and individuals haven't been completing that. So we have a lot of voters who are in the system. They're not voting. This is an interesting example of some of the challenges we have with innovation in the election space right now. Uh, NAV voters sort of are suddenly brought into voting. It might be their first time or new to them. And they're surprised that they don't get to participate in the primaries. Uh, so for states with closed primaries where you must be registered with that party to participate in that election, uh, NAVs sort of create possibly a new pain point in the election experience because a lot of voters aren't participating in the primary. The general comes around there, well, hey, I, I didn't get to have a say in who my options are. This might be another piece as we look forward that might be a challenge thinking about how we uh, work with AVR in Oregon and maybe start talking about some primary uh, policy innovations. Um, some other innovations that are out there uh, for those that are not in the automatic voter registration world, election day registration. Um, that allows you to walk into a polling place uh, with the appropriate documentation demonstrating where you live and that you're a resident of the state uh, and cast either a ballot in the normal style there or a provisional ballot, allowing you to vote the same day. And so this is a way to work sometimes around the automatic voter registration concerns about things like NAV uh, assignments. Uh, two states, just notably, so there's a, this is if you get into this and you join the election nerd team, uh, election day registration is not the same as same day registration. Uh, two states in particular, Montana and North Carolina, you can do same day registration, which is during the early voting period. So there's a window of time prior to election day where you can go into a vote center, uh, fill out some paperwork, cast a ballot there, but it's not allowed on election day itself. And finally, you can be North Dakota and not have an official registration. Uh, there, they have ID requirements, uh, residency requirements as you vote there, but there's not actually a, a list maintained. So list maintenance is a huge challenge, uh, one that takes up a lot of computational worries. 
this is a product of essentially the 2000 elections. Uh, Help America Vote Act in 2002 uh, pushed for centralized voter registration systems across the US. I'm showing here a terribly illegible graphic on a screen. This is a database schematic for a voter registration system just to prove the point how complex these things are. Uh, one of the challenges here is that uh, we had a, a spurt of federal activity uh, post HAVA, uh, the Help America Vote Act, and then we have not in a while had any new investments. So some of these systems are getting long in the tooth. Uh, Oregon in particular right now is in the process of updating its centralized voter registration system with the new Oregon Votes system that's in development. Uh, this is exciting for a lot of us uh, to sort of see some opportunities for addressing some of the legacy challenges of the database system, but again, is also a little bit of a worry as we see uh, how the implementation might roll out. Some of the key questions when it comes to voter rolls is what to do about inactive voters. And you may have heard in previous um, discussions sort of in the media about purges or sort of removing voters. Uh, and I'm always cautious as both an election uh, researcher, but someone who engages with election administration, that that can become a real loaded term. Uh, I want to remind a lot of folks that, you know, the U.S. is a mobile population. Uh, eight and a half million voting age adults moved counties just in the 2000, 2001 period, right? This is during the pandemic where we had a lot of folks sort of leaving, uh, going and moving to new opportunities, moving out of cities, maybe moving closer to family. Another 3.3 million uh, deaths in 2020. And so that means that according to the Electronic Registration Information Center, about one in eight voting records can be out of date at any given moment because of just that natural movement of people. Uh, and so when you hear those conversations about voter registration files, just be mindful that this is also a legacy of who we are as people. We move around uh, and we try to, we don't have a single national system. So it's hard to plug in and know exactly what's going on. There has been some great work in this space. Eric, uh, which I have on the slide here, the Electronic Registration Information System, the state nonprofit partnership. Uh, that does matching of voter files with DMV, Social Security Administration files, and other resources, including Postal Service, to understand uh, how maybe Paul Manson has moved around in a given year and help keep those records up to date. As we've seen the expansion of um, vote by mail options, the Postal Service is now a huge part of that infrastructure, uh, both because we uh, learn where people are, but also in order to help with the delivery of ballots. So that's the voter registration side of things. And when we move over to sort of preparation and early voting, um, the bottom bullet is probably the most important point on the slide. Election day is now, well, not a day in many states. And this has been a challenge for us in terms of educating the public about interpreting results, right? Voter voter um, Voters expect sort of election day to have a, an outcome. Uh, and that may be just an artifact of a window of time in US history over the past 20, 30 years that you know, we're in a way returning to a previous model where it took time to tabulate uh, election results before modernization. And now we've made them more complex for other reasons that increase access. Uh, election day, uh, if you back up, it's amazing if you get a chance, the um, voting manuals and calendars, the deadlines, from election administration perspective, uh, this is sort of an annual event now, especially if you have multiple elections, things are always happening. Overseas and uniformed military voters sort of kick us off when we start seeing that um, initial ballots are being prepared. Many states have early in-person voting options. So these might be vote centers um, or opportunities to come vote prior that are more convenient. Absentee voting sort of kicked us off on this idea of thinking about how to vote um, from home, which has been the terminology more lately. And then COVID-19 and the um, work from home shift really kicked off both temporary and permanent changes in our access to vote by mail opportunities. So you'll see here sometimes a distinction between states that have uh, early in-person voting, states that have absentee. Uh, with the absentee, there's always a question about uh, whether you have to have an excuse or not. COVID-19 in most states was then deemed to be sort of a broad excuse. Everybody was permitted. Some states limit that. Uh, you have to have a valid reason, whether it's medical or personal or access. But then increasingly states have adopted the universal vote by mail model. Um, this is, uh, I think right now we're at seven states that have that fully implemented. Uh, and then polling day places, the traditional one. This is how I learned to vote. Uh, when I cast my first ballot, you know, it was going to a local church, uh, walking into the booth and pulling a lever. Uh, and that is increasingly sort of that image is not what we, we see in practice anymore across the US. It's a very diverse experience now. 
This is a slide that shares just the different technologies that are used for um, ballot tabulation. And it's out of date a little bit, but what I like about it is it shows the variation. So you see some states are sort of fully using a single system. Other states, you have like Texas here, right? County by county variation. Uh, California had more variation that sort of moved forward now because this is from uh, eight, year, or, yeah, eight years ago, six years ago. Uh, but really, this is the, the show the story that a local election administration really happens on the ground, and you can see a lot of variation across it. To bring us to Oregon, this is sort of an effort we made to sort of think about uh, the lifestyle, the, the life of a ballot, and it's actually missing a step on here. But you can think about up in the top, there's this cycle where we think about voter registration, uh, the data coming into the Oregon election system. Uh, we have a centralized voter registration database. And as we approach election day, local election officials sort of scan the landscape that they're working in, talking to special districts, cities, county, state, and we have to start designing ballot styles for each of those different combinations of races. Now, uh, this is a key thing to also remember that in the U.S., uh, we have tens of thousands of special districts, and they have boundaries that when you start intersecting them, require different ballots for anyone who lives within those. You may be voting for a road district, a special district like a school district, and so all of this then creates some variation. Uh, in the mail cycle, then we send ballots out. We get some data through the post office there uh, if we have undelivered pieces. Uh, and then if it's successfully to the voter and the voter casts the ballot, this is a fun little fact. If you happen to have this happen in Oregon, you can return your ballot to any county drop box. So if you happen to be on that road trip down to see grandparents uh, and you're not in your county, that's okay. The county you will visit in Oregon will help get it back home for you. On the election day side of things, where then we really see more activity to think about as sort of a traditional piece is uh, signature verification, all of the work in opening and uh, tabulating ballots. Uh, what I said was missing from here is that if a signature review is unsuccessful, there is a process that then the voter is contacted to cure uh, the ballot. They can come in and demonstrate, yes, that was me. This was my ballot. I did cast it. Uh, that's in part because for our system in Oregon, right, we're comparing, and this varies county by county, we're comparing um, signatures to what's on the back of the envelope. And that's also changed a little bit as we've modernized systems. Uh, I'm hearing some more challenges in terms of which signatures are saved on file uh, and also options for software to help with that verification process. Um, I will say, if you're in Multnomah County or any county in Oregon and you haven't seen this process in person, I really recommend it. It's really neat to sort of see even the lead up to the election, the days when the mail is coming in, uh, watching the sorting process, the opening process, and how that's done. Um, if you ever want to get those democratic warm and fuzzies, right, go to a naturalization ceremony and go watch elections uh, being conducted. Two great ways to do that. But I do recommend that. It's a really neat way to sort of see how this process unfolds. Um, the back end. So once the election has been uh, finalized, there is then a canvassing and certification period, which is um, you know, what's interesting now in Oregon, right, we now have the postmark is the deadline instead of actually the receipt in office. And so that changes um, how we think about calling elections and understanding it. So one of the, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key messages is election day is no longer really the election day. It doesn't equal results. Uh, and so what I have on here is just an example is the same challenge we had back in Florida in 2000, repeated again here in Oregon when we were unable to sort of figure out what was going, with the, going on with the primary uh, in 2020. And so this is sort of a, a constant challenge. Uh, the public has come to expect that we would know the results of an election on election day. And I think a lot of us who are in this space are trying to carefully nudge voters to understand we may not know, and that is okay. Um, there actually, which will add some interesting challenges here. Alaska rolled out ranked choice voting. The city of Portland just approved that. These more complex voting systems will require more time. And so another key message here that we're trying to get out is um, patience. It'll take some time to understand these. In the canvassing and certification uh, period, where we're reviewing the ballots, uh, conducting some of the audit pieces or starting to, resolving provisionals, if there's a recount requirement based on how close races are, and then the final certification and statement. Again, this takes time. There's a 45-day window in Oregon in which the certification has to occur. But what I really want to make sure is understood is that we have now this, I think, 60 days before the election to do a CAVA, 45. You know, about a third of the year uh, now centered around election day is what's required in order to administer an election. The last part of the election life cycle I want to share with you before I shift over um, to some other topics is audits. 
Um, and this is something that I think is important to talk about carefully because uh, after the cyber ninja experience in Arizona, where uh, you essentially have sort of non-state actors, I guess I'll say, uh, participating in their own audit process, um, it's good to let the public know what we do audit and that audits aren't sort of a measure of failure, but rather a great check. Um, Oregon, we do have audits and it's based on um, the, the distance between um, the both post the margin of victory and the total votes cast. And so there's different tools that are sort of just go see how the technology is working. Um, I mentioned traditional versus risk limiting here. Those are two different approaches where a traditional might look at, all right, we're gonna take this one machine tabulation machine or one precinct and sort of do a manual recount on that to see how it worked within that system. The risk limiting audit is an emergent technology. It's allowed in a number of states that are shown on the graphic here. It's a statistical approach. It samples ballots and compares how the results of that sampling are to the reported results. And if you get certain deviations between the sampling and the actual, then that sort of tells you whether there's maybe something going on there. Um, risk limiting audits aren't sort of uniformly accepted because in part, that statistical model is harder for interpretation, both for those that are making decisions, but for the public really. Um, I think many of the public have rightfully um, trusted that election administration is rock solid, and it is. Uh, and so the idea of sort of sampling, I think they they expect some sort of replication, uh, a more full recount. Another emergent area is the idea of election performance audits. This is something that's starting to get some traction, and it's the idea that we might be able to apply some data science tools uh, to explore how things like automatic voter registration and ballot returns by the mail can be tracked in real time to look for potential anomalies. And these anomalies may not be um, bad actors, but rather some sort of interruption in service that we need to be aware of that are hard to trace. An interesting component with um, automatic voter registration and vote by mail is that the, the election infrastructure, uh, the system we use to administer elections has become more complex. It's no longer just the elections office, it's the DMV, the postal service. And so there's more connections along the way that we still have to keep an eye on. And as an example of that, um, about two years ago, uh, colleagues, uh, myself, Paul Gronke reed and then some uh, team members at Caltech um, sort of ran a test on the Oregon election <laughs> process to sort of see, can we measure differences and find out what that baseline sort of noise in the system is? And so here you're seeing the daily change in voter registration numbers uh, as a percent within counties. And we really want to understand what those dynamics are because uh, there had been sort of a, a well-publicized moment where Facebook, uh, without talking to local election officials, did a big um, get out the vote, voter registration effort. Uh, that voter registration effort created a spike in activity and no one knew where it came from necessarily immediately. There wasn't a coordination there. So being able to monitor these flows um, in that case to identify good actors, um, but also identify any potential failures. And so these sorts of technologies are still in development and emerging. Uh, similarly, you know, looking at reporting at ballots that are coming back late. And so trying to find out if there's something going on with voter education or voter outreach. Um, this was also out of the uh, 2018 election cycle that we experimented on these data. And I just share these in the sense that we have to start thinking about as a, with a more modernized system, what are some of the potential data science components that might help out uh, in making sense of what's going on within these elections? Okay. I've mentioned that audits are very much a part of sort of a public opinion or public perception. Uh, we had done some polling in Oregon to explore this. And I think it's another tool to think about understanding uh, at the state level, how are voters seeing their election process unfold? Um, confidence is high in general. Oregonians love their system. Um, we outperform the nation, generally speaking. And so that's great. There are still some concerns out there. And some of the things we found in our, our survey of Oregon voters is that um, some of the details, like where ballots can get returned to, when they're due, if audits occur, are not well known. So, so there's still, even in a state like Oregon, where we have this very engaged election system, there's still some room for improvement there. This is uh, out of the 2020 election. So good news, uh, voters trust the vote uh, in their states, in their county, and their own vote. They're nervous across the border. Uh, they're not sure what's going on in that state. And so let me explore a little bit of that as we get into the, the who are the stewards piece, because I'm going to compare this slide as well to who the voters are. Um, I'll pause here for a moment. And Diane or Jennifer, if you have any questions that are in the chat, um, let me know. And if not, we can start talking about the, the individuals that occupy this role. 
We do have one question, um, and, and Christopher, if you want to jump in, I'll just read it the way you have it here, but if you want to jump in and add additional um, uh, context, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in there. Um, so Christopher Frost is asking, um, in your surveys, have you found particular strengths or weaknesses in the individual board or divided systems? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I have not immediately, I don't think I've actually, um, so the question there would be, do we see different voter perspectives or do we see different election outcomes or election administration outcomes? Uh, and we've not tested that. I think what part of the challenge is actually that some of those differences probably represent uh, a difference in the geographies, the size of those jurisdictions that are involved. And so that's where we run into some challenges. But that's a great question. And actually, uh, I'll go fire up the the R and start doing some stats later on this weekend. I like that idea. Uh, no, we haven't identified anything there, but we haven't, haven't looked at it. So thanks for that question. So let me tell you a little bit about the election officials themselves. Um, I mentioned earlier on about eight to 10,000 of these individuals. Uh, you know, what's really interesting is that they tend to be termed as sort of clerical roles, but they're interpreting election law. They're interpreting constitutional law in many ways. Uh, they're unique as a local official. They, about half of them are elected half are appointed. It depends on the jurisdiction. Um, some, especially those that are appointed, might just entirely run elections. But many who are elected provide a whole suite of local municipal services. They might be the clerk to the county commission or the city commission. Uh, they might administer marriage licenses, dog license. Some run you know, parks and cemetery plots, right? Very diverse set of work. Uh, and their, their work is really driven by their experience. And we've moved into a really unprecedented period of pressure. So here's the 2020, just some great shots from the experience. Shauna Dozer, who is the Clayton County Elections Director in Georgia, uh, you know, three, two, <clears throat> two in the morning on CNN. I don't think any election official in 2000 thought that part of their job description would be uh, being on national media, explaining uh, vote returns at two in the morning Eastern. Uh, so one of the reasons I share this is it's uh, showing some of the changing nature of this work and what it means for those that occupy it. So let me share with you some of the past research. So the first local election official research kicked off in 2004, right after the Help America Votes Act. Um, David Kimball, Barry Burden, and a number of others, along with the Congressional Research Service, uh, conducted a number of surveys. And then there was a pause after 2008. We kicked off our work in 2018. And what I wanted to highlight here is some interesting demographic components, sort of who the individuals are. And again, remember my story of the 75%, 8% problem. We do have to wrestle with sort of who individuals are and where they sit and what they represent on this uh, plot because I'm giving you an average across the US. So a lot of those small townships and small counties are in here. But generally speaking, you know, a local election official in the US, um, about half of them are elected. They are predominantly women. Uh, one of the things I'm interested in in this research is we may have one of the biggest groups of elected women in the US that are understudied. Do we understand why uh, and what motivates them to, to run for office, be in these positions? Is it an opening to other elective options? Um, but we don't know yet. That's something we're still working on. Racial diversity is really missing from this conversation. And I'm, I'll share a slide on that in a moment. There's a real political geography reason for that. Um, it's sort of how we've designed these geographies. Um, what we've seen here is it's increasingly being professionalized. So um, higher education, um, is definitely more common now. Pay has been pretty stable. Uh, these with inflation adjusted dollars, it's been pretty stable and it's not a big number. And again, this is a small jurisdiction versus big. And when it comes to retirements, a slide I'll share in a moment, uh, this is also another concern that this population is aging and we're starting to see some worries about what that change down the road is. Pretty split on the partisan side, which is good to see, it sort of represents America in many good ways. Um, and was one of the possible strengths too of this design. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I'm really interested in this component about the gender piece. You know, we see maybe uh, you know 90% are women, and that doesn't match with what we see in other elected offices in the U.S. Uh, and so we want to understand what's going on there. Some of the theories that you know help explain and understand this, and I'll, I'll come back to this later on as well. But you know. Is there some sort of gatekeeping um, that limits women to staying just the clerk role? Uh, or is the nature of the work something that's been um, filtered and is perceived to be sort of male versus female work, right? That's sort of gendering it. Um, or is it just that, you know, these offices don't have the right types of power to attract certain types of competition? Um, I'll share that in my experience with the interviews, I'm really seeing a lot of the dynamics here, probably this last one that Victoria Gordon talks about, which is local election officials 
prior to the sort of hubaloo we're in now, uh, were jobs that allowed for women to manage the two to three careers society expects of them, sort of work in the workplace, at home, multi-generational care. Uh, that the sort of ebb and flow of work in the election office was really conducive to that, strong benefits, um, and that was really an attractive component. The reason that's important now is that we've changed the nature of the work. It's become very politicized, very visual. Folks are on CNN at two in the morning. That's going to be a threat to uh, the recruitment challenges for this population because uh, some of the assumptions going in are no longer the same. Uh, here's a piece that I really enjoy because this sort of shows, you know, we've got this tale of long serving election officials and then a big bump uh, of folks who come in and mostly after when we've changed how we do election administration in the US. Uh, that blue line uh, gives us sort of the mark of the median, the 2007. Remember in 2002 is when we passed the Help America Votes Act. And so we're now moved into a new generation of local election officials. And it's really important to understand that they, you know, there's, they know now sort of this more busy period. Uh, also, this varies by size of the jurisdiction. So what you're seeing here is that same plot of sort of when they started working. And what we're seeing is that really the turnover is happening in these smaller jurisdictions less than 25,000 uh, registered voters, um, that the folks who have been in this longer are in the larger, and that makes sense. So this gives us a sense also of another dynamic here where um, maybe folks are sort of moving up and filtering into higher positions, larger jurisdictions, or the larger jurisdictions are investing in that position and so retention is higher. Generally speaking, we see more elected uh, um, positions on the smaller size. Let me just show that. So in the smaller jurisdictions about you know, 60% are elected versus the very large jurisdictions, you know, your Multnomah counties, King counties, uh, where it's more likely to be appointed or hired serving at will. And so this is another interesting dynamic. Uh, I was surprised when we asked where folks came from, you know, one of the pieces we've always been interested in is sort of where they came from prior to election administration. Um, and it's about split between the public sector and private sector. So the private sector individuals are people who have taken an interest in democracy and want to serve. And so they've chosen to run for office. Uh, the other side, the public sector, are people who've been maybe in county government somewhere else uh, or uh, in uh, some sort of service to the county commission. Um, I've seen this. We're, we're conducting interviews right now, and that's this is a dynamic that does pop up. Someone was in county administration, really got interested in elections, decided to move over. And then we have a small percentage. Uh, we actually thought this would be bigger of folks who are either vendors making voting equipment or on parties or campaign election campaigns. Um, but we don't see a whole lot of movement from the political side into the administration side, which I think has some interesting implications that these, these roles really have done a good job of sort of sitting in that administrative side. They're very connected to parties, but they're not, they're not seeing movement back and forth. Um, I'm going to dive into some of these in a little bit more detail, but I want to share at a high level, uh, you know, job satisfaction has been really high and we don't see a big gender difference. So men and women both um, are very satisfied with the role they play. Where the gender challenges start to pop up come um, in terms of work-life balance. And so uh, what we're seeing here is that women sharing more concern that really the work and home priorities uh, are harder to balance now. Uh, and again, that goes back when I was sharing that theoretical construct, you know, we're worried that uh, this was a job previously that allowed flexibility and accommodations for uh, women who had to balance multiple priorities in life. And the stress of the work might now be a new source of turnover and challenge. Pay is also skewed, and in large part, this is because we tend to find men um, serving as local election officials in larger jurisdictions in sort of a 50-50 versus the small where it's more that 90-10%. And so the pay in smaller jurisdictions is lower, as low as, you know, we have folks sharing under $20,000, $20, under $35,000. Uh, and so that's clustered there, that, that second set, the 34000 around women. So we see a pay imbalance and we see a stress imbalance. Um, despite that, and this, I share this because it's sort of interesting, I'm not sure necessarily how to interpret it, uh, even though there is a disparity, uh, women and men are sort of equally satisfied with what they're getting. Um, there's a little bit of variation, but not a ton, which might mean that there's something also going on with what the other options are within those jurisdictions that women are working in. I mentioned diversity early on. You know, one of the challenges on these geographies is uh, we don't have a lot of non-white local election officials. This is a predominantly white space. Um, and part of that is because um, with so many small townships and counties, even if I did a random draw of an individual in that jurisdiction, um, they those jurisdictions are predominantly white. 
So in essence, the structural design of how we administer elections and elect individuals to run them, just even a random draw will skew towards white representation. Uh, we actually have a hard time even studying race in our survey because of the, such low response rates among non-white uh, local election officials. This past year in 2022, we actually oversampled every jurisdiction in the U.S. that was majority minority voter. Uh, and that still didn't really move our numbers to sort of hear from minority voices. Um, what we do see, if I squish all three years together and sort of deduplicate it, it does appear that there's some loose trends. So these dots here are saying it looks like in jurisdictions that are more diverse, you are more likely to see diverse local election officials. So from a descriptive or bureaucratic representation perspective, there's some good news there, despite the national numbers looking very much like we don't have a diverse workforce. Where there is diversity, it appears at least it's happening in the places that serve diverse electorates. Some guarded good news there, but again, by design here, um, it's not the most complete sample to make that conclusion. So the big piece here, and this was the pivot in 2022 for us, and I'm gonna share some multi-year data now. How are these stewards of democracy doing? They've made it through uh, worries about hacking, Russian interference, uh, a tumultuous period in uh, US politics at the presidential level, uh, this little pandemic thing that happened, and oh, so many other crises. Uh, and so the next few slides I'll share with you sort of what the dynamics have been over time. Top level, they're doing good. They say they're doing good, but you know, there's some obvious stuff out there that are stressors. Uh, one of the big challenges that we have in surveying local election officials is that they have a stiff upper lip. Uh, they'll get the work done uh, at personal sacrifice even. And so it is challenging as a survey researcher to sort of tease out what those, what those pain points are. At a high level though, workloads are really up. So self-reported workloads are really increasing and importantly increasing in jurisdictions where maybe there's less capacity to handle that. Yet, yet job satisfaction remains high. Uh, as I shared earlier, the work-life balance is a concern. I'll share some responses here too on what we call the voter-centric perspectives. And this is the idea that at one point in time, local election administration was really centered around sort of a clerical role or maybe a tabulation role and not a voter engagement role. Uh, we're seeing that local election officials really embrace their role as sort of the face of elections. They want to be involved in turnout. They want to be involved in voter education, which is all great news. The last bullet here, confidence. And confidence is a particular measure for us in political science. It's essentially a question about whether individuals believe votes are counted appropriately or not. Confidence in elections among the LEOs is slipping. Uh, and it's slipping in a particular way that I'll talk about in a moment. As a side note, uh, I have to do one of my favorite election administration photos here, Secretary of State Paulus uh, watching as the votes are counted uh, over the disincorporation vote for Antelope. Uh, if you watch Well Well Country, uh, this will connect back to that great Oregon story. Um, but again, also sort of an image of this sort of gendered nature of election administration for the past 30, 40 years. So, I mentioned the workload is up. So this is overall, we asked this question the past four election cycles. Um, what you're seeing here are the average responses that election administration is a majority or all of their workload. Um, this is a tricky question. I have election officials who sort of said, you know, it's more than a majority, right? I'm working 110%. So um, I think next year I'm going to have to ask this a little bit differently. Uh, but you see there's an uptick and it makes sense. 2020, a huge pivot for many states. Uh, maybe they went to universal absentee ballots. Maybe they increased vote by mail, mail options. Uh, the pandemic had a huge impact. What is really interesting to me is that we see that this change is really happening among the smaller and medium-sized jurisdictions. So maybe not a huge impact on the large ones. In fact, the large ones probably have a fully dedicated source. So that's that makes sense. Uh, but it's at the smaller level that we're running into some challenges. Um, and that tells me that we have to sort of keep an eye at the local, more rural jurisdictions that might be um, coping with sort of a rapid change in the environment that they weren't expecting. I think these are also jurisdictions that might be facing some more of the politicized challenges as well, depending on where they are in the US. And again, you know, on the size level, satisfaction though seems pretty stable. So I showed you the gender breakout on this. Um, it's interesting to see that job satisfaction is pretty high, uh, no matter what the size is. Um, and the, the, one of my favorite ways to explore this is it gives them a sense of personal accomplishment. So really high agreement here. Like this is a calling in many ways. Now, the workload uh, that I was showing before is going up. It's not 
reasonable, right? So the agreement here, the blue is agreement with the statement. The red is saying they disagree. So we're seeing, especially in the large jurisdictions, you know, 50, 60% that it's not a reasonable workload. So this is a pain point we're really worrying about. Um, the balance between work life and home life. Uh, again, this is showing up primarily among women and we find women in the smaller jurisdictions. And so that plays out here as well. Smaller jurisdictions, they can't balance home and work priorities. Um, and this is, again, we worry about this from a turnover perspective. And satisfaction with pay is up. But again, this is something in the smaller jurisdictions that is a, a source of worry uh, because there, that's where we really see the disagreement with this, that the pay might be problematic there. Um, and so despite the gender breakout, which I shared with you, if we look at this by size, then we see that um, some of those medium-sized jurisdictions, smaller ones, um, have some real concerns. Again, we presume that this feeds into worries about turnover, uh, loss of institutional knowledge within election administration. Um, if you're curious and you're a survey person and you're into sort of the HR side or organizational side of things, these are uh, a series of 10 questions that we ask in our job satisfaction battery. And, you know, mostly stable numbers, right? So this is a lot on a slide on Zoom, but I'll call your attention to a handful of them uh, where we see them below that 50% or sort of standing still. Um, you know, the I can't balance work and home priorities is on the way up, that worry. Um, this is sort of a fun twist. We ask if they would encourage their child to go into local election administration as a way to sort of test that, that gut response. And that's below 50% and has dropped, right? So we're at the lowest point we're at in the 2022 survey. Workload is reasonable right below that. Again, it's it dipped below 50% in 2020, which makes sense and stayed there. But the personal accomplishment stays high, though we do have a little bit of a downturn in 2022. So some cause for concern here that the stress might be starting to grow. If I break these out by small jurisdictions, um, same dynamics, but aside from there's a, that balancing in the very large jurisdictions, pretty common across the size breakouts, no matter uh, where you are in terms of jurisdiction size. I, the larger ones, I do worry about this middle one that says, I do not feel I can balance my work and home priorities. That one might be um, stressing on our largest jurisdictions. And remembering again, those large ones are a small group of local election officials, but they serve three quarters of voters in the US. So from a voter um, experience perspective or an election outcome perspective, um, that might be a more vulnerable set of actors to start saying they're stressed out uh, and we wanna pay attention to them. I mentioned that voter-centric perspective. So this is something we asked them if they enjoy educating citizens. Do they think it's part of their job um, to do education and increase voter satisfaction? We asked them if they have time to do that work. Uh, how much are um, how much is citizen knowledge a barrier to their work? And is it one of their primary responsibilities to um, do this election work or voter education work? And we see great responses here. So across the board, we're seeing that uh, voter-centric numbers. If you see the dots below the red line here, it's because we've inverted the way we ask the question. So, you know, do they have enough time? Well, no, uh, a lot of them say they don't have enough time or resources to do it. And they really are saying that the primary responsibility is paired, run elections, but also do voter education. So this is a good news story for us. Local election officials are really dedicated to that voter experience. And we don't see a ton of variation here by size, a little bit in the smalls when it comes to um, citizen knowledge. Um, I think smaller jurisdictions have a better face-to-face -face relationship with voters. So the concerns there around voter education are a little bit more um, constrained. What's fun with this, I'm happy to report, we don't see a lot of partisan activity for the most part. So when I break out local election officials by um, their own party identification, uh, partisanship is not huge here with two I guess with maybe minor distinctions. Uh, in the upper right corner here, you see one I outlined in red that says local election officials should work to reduce demographic disparities in turnout. We wrestled with how to write that question, but really asking about sort of full access across uh, minority representation in democracy. And you do see that Democrats are more likely to say this is something that's important. They're not 100%, which is interesting. Um, I will also share that among local election officials, about 40% of them will not share with us a party identification, which is an option that we give them on the survey that you, they prefer not to share. Um, and so that's on here in the sort of brown color. Um, and I just share that because that means that a lot of our, our partisan identification work here, at, at a grain of salt, folks aren't necessarily always sharing with us um, what's going on in those. But otherwise, party ID does not seem to drive a ton of the sort of voter-centric perspectives, which is good news, I think, uh, for us to take home. 
Election confidence, this is a little bit of a flashing red light for us. Um, what I've circled here is um, the one change that popped up in 2022 that raised our eyebrows. Uh, these are the confidence items that are used in the cooperative election study, and then we also use them in our survey. And it says, um, I am confident that votes in my state will be counted as intended. And they didn't go below 50%, but we're at about 66% agree with that statement in 2022. Um, that's worrisome. Uh, this is a drop from what had been very high numbers. Uh, and so we want to keep an eye on that. We've traditionally seen concern about sort of what happens in other states. And so if you're looking at this bar, uh, this plot here, the two bottom ones, essentially confidence in the state snapped into alignment with confidence in the nationwide. And nationwide has always been lower than the state. So that's a worrying trend. Um, I'm curious to see what happens as we go forward with this in 2024. Um, but this is sort of a red flag because traditionally local election officials have been gung-ho. Their states do great jobs. Uh, votes are going to be counted. And so we're a little bit worried about that. To understand where we're seeing that, it's driven in part by size. And so the um, very small jurisdictions, confidence dropped much more quickly. Uh, and, but it did drop for all sizes. So this is, again, another source of some concern for us as we look ahead to the next election cycle. Also to share with this, and I'm sorry, this one's a little bit harder to see, but the this is comparing the public. So we asked the same voter confidence question of the public and local election officials. And what we see here is that essentially in 2022, in 2020, because um, I don't have the 2022 data yet, in 2020, uh, local election officials started to look more like the mass public. And so, you know, the, the worrisome piece is, yes, it's down in confidence, but maybe this is just saying local election officials are people too, and they're starting to become uh, more vulnerable to the same media messaging, same concerns that are out there. And so the, the, pes the pessimistic worry there, of course, is that this is sort of a loss in faith. Optimistic is this might be just an education and an ongoing conversation piece that might heal over time. I've got a lot of questions about sort of threats um, and what local election officials have experienced. And I just want to share with you that we have been exploring this. It's still something we're wrestling with um, because it's a hard one to ask. We know that it is happening. Uh, and so we've been asking if they're concerned at all about reports of abuse, harassment, and threats directed at election officials, sort of generally. Um, and concern is there. It's clustered uh, in different types of jurisdictions, which is interesting. And so what you're seeing here is sort of the very concerned 44%, 42% in the South and Western parts of the United States. And I think really what's going on there is a size dynamic yet again, because uh, those concerns are really clustered among the largest jurisdictions. Uh, and that's important because two thirds of jurisdictions in the Midwest and Northeast are these very small ones. So they're not expressing worry. Um, whereas in the South, small is 48%. So what's, something's happening in these larger jurisdictions. And I think you can think about it from watching the news recently, whether it's sort of Maricopa County, LA County, other states um, having experiences with individuals at the front counter or at Dropbox sites. So all of this is a lead up then to ask the final bit of questions, which is, are people going to leave? Uh, we've seen news reports. Uh, we've heard through the grapevine that um, there's going to be a great departure. And it does seem like there's more concern. So to explore that, we've been asking if they're eligible to retire. Uh, and about a third of local election officials are eligible to retire. So that's a piece to keep an eye on. We then follow up, are you planning on retiring in the next two years? And that's going up. And just to give you, so you know, we're seeing 7%, 13% now in 2022. So that's a, that's a large number of local election officials. And to compare it to the workforce, 2% retire each year. The federal workforce sees about 3% annually. So this is accelerated, um, even if you double those numbers, right? This is a really um, worrisome trend potentially. We also know there are people who will leave, not because they can retire, but they just want to leave in general. And so when we add those numbers together, uh, we're looking at maybe one in five local election officials that are serving now will not be in their office in 2024. Uh, I'll be candid with you. I've had conversations with local election officials that are extremely emotional. These election cycles have moved from being sort of a source of pride and joy um, to a real personal challenge. Um, the types of public engagements, uh, what's happening at the front counter in election offices or at the supermarket or at the school um, has become toxic. And so we do worry that we're looking at a 20% loss in this workforce. These are the chief local election officials we're asking, the people who lead their office. And so what we don't know is the institutional knowledge embedded in the staff. And that's something we're trying to figure out how to explore. It's a really hard thing to survey on. 
Um, but it's it's a it's a warning uh, that we need to pay attention to not just the local election officials, but their team. Are they feeling taken care of? Do they feel like they're protected? Do they feel like we have their back? Uh, and I think right now the concern is no, that sense is not there. Not to end on a bad note, let me just turn this around a little bit. You know, overall, the great news story here is the work is rewarding. Local election officials love doing it. They love working with voters. They will get the job done. Uh, they are pros. Uh, but the balance is hard, and we're seeing increasing headwinds. Um, you know, the feeling of value and respect are up. There's consultation challenges, though. So one thing I've heard in some of the conversations I've had with local election officials is legislatures are proposing new changes. Congress is proposing new changes. Hold on. Uh, talk to me first. See how an election works. Uh, as we add these changes, we just make that work more complex. And then finally, the election confidence item is starting to mirror the general public, which means we need to be sort of paying attention to how this messaging is happening. So what does that mean for 2024? Well, you know, what's interesting is I think a lot of us in, in my world went into 2022 really sort of like just crossing our fingers and toes and holding our breath and any other good luck charms that are possible. 2022 went great. Um, you know, we did have some very um, public bumps in the road, whether they were sort of, um, you know, attempts at maybe forms of voter intimidation or questions about auditing, but in general, stuff worked really well. So it's a good news story. 2024, looking ahead, we've got a lot of worries still. Um, you know, this misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. So if you hear MDM in the election space, that's what that means. So how are bad actors or uninformed actors spreading news? This comic in the lower right corner is from CISA, which is a DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, cybersecurity team. They've got a, a comic book on disinformation, uh, but it's, you know, very focused on elections, which tells you sort of where the worry is. Another pain point for 2024, we've just seen a skyrocket in public records requests, um, which is not a bad thing on its own, but it's a huge um, sort of consumption of time and staff resources. And it appears to be fueled by um, social media itself. So the public records requests are copy and paste sort of requests from across the US. They may not even fit the local state administrative system. You know, you don't ask Oregon clerks about polling places, right? We don't have those. Um, but they're also becoming increasingly detailed. They're asking for raw ballot images or um, data reports from ballot systems that are not commonly available. And this creates a lot of new uncertainty. What is allowed to be released? Do people know it's going out? And lots of challenges there. Change in staff, the retirement concerns, change in administrative rules and technology. These will all be issues going forward. I think... Um, I heard from some colleagues that are keeping a database of state proposals for legislative changes to elections. Uh, this past legislative session was double any year on record they had prior. So we're seeing a ton of legislative interest in election administration. That, especially when we go into high stakes elections, will become a stress point. Uh, I think if you ask most local election, election officials, don't tinker with election rules in the big years, right? In those presidential years. Uh, if you want to try some innovations, find the off years, find the off cycle elections, test it out there, see what happens. And then lastly, we've heard a lot, uh, a big loss in, in states with poll workers that they have less poll workers. In states like Oregon, where we uh, rely on part-time workers or staff to help on election day, that's also been a barrier. Um, COVID's part of that. They tend to be older volunteers. And so COVID um, definitely uh, kept folks at home, but also we're hearing threats directed at poll workers or at election workers is another barrier. So this is what we watched for in 2024. Um, I'll close by, you know, sharing that we're thankful the Democracy Fund supported the uh, local election official survey 2018 to 2022. Uh, we now have some support from uh, the MIT Election Data Science Lab for the 2023 election. Uh, we have a big team of students that have helped us out over time. Always awesome. But I'm most appreciative of LEOs uh, who respond to my survey, which I know is no small thing hours of labor, and they help us out. I hope I can carry their message forward. Um, if you're interested in more of this, uh, more information about it, uh, visit the evic.read.edu site. We have all of our survey instruments there, uh, cross tabs, all of the data reports. Uh, happy to take questions here or send me an email, uh, check in with us and happy to chat about it. And Diane and Jennifer, with that, that is what I wanted to share with you all. Is that all, Paul? That is all. <laughs> I want to tell you there's hidden slides too, if you want. What an information light <laughs> session. Uh, no, that was a wonderful. Ball. I hope you're all election nerds with me now. Come join. Come join. It's a fun space.
Well, Paul, my first question, because you are asking, how can we be election nerds? So in some situations, these are hired positions, um, you know, more more administrative positions. So how would you suggest the like, say, I want to be become a, a, a local election official? What would you suggest would be the first step? Go volunteer, go watch an election, go help out in your county office, your township office, uh, call them up and see even just a tour. Uh, tours are a blast. Uh, if you get a chance, call your, your county clerk or your election director and say, hey, um, do you have time where I can come down? You know, be mindful of election day. But uh, in Oregon, uh, for those that are in Oregon, I, I think the same for Washington as well. The lead up to an election is a fun time as the mail starts to come in. You get a sense of what's going on. Um, but offer to help. You know, one I know one of the challenges for those of us with, with drop boxes, right, is um, you need two people to go out and collect those ballots and come back. Uh, you know, if you're in a, a county like Lane County where you've got Florence on one end and the Cascades on the other, that's no small feat. Uh, so volunteer, get involved. If you're academically oriented, if you're a grad student, um, there are a ton of data resources out there that uh, are collected every year uh, that go unanalyzed, right? We tend to pull these in just to sort of get a pulse of what's going on, but neat research opportunities that I also hope sort of raise the voice uh, and perspective of local election officials. Thank you. Um, I know we're running a little over, but so those who need to leave, feel free. But um, if you have any other questions for Paul, I'll uh, open it up to the group. And feel free to unmute your videos as well. I did want to jump in and let you know that we we do have somebody who said that uh, there was an A plus use of memes and, <laughs> and gifts during the presentation. So. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. The community, everything's on fire one was hilarious. <laughs> you know, in this age of Zoom presentations, you have to find ways to, you know, spice this up a little bit, right? Make it make it relevant for Gen Z, right? <laughs> Hi, Ina. Do you have a, a question? No, just um, it was a really good presentation. And I really enjoyed the uh, the finding. So, thank you for sharing it with us. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, Paul, just one other follow up question. So you mentioned that fear of abuse has become a, a higher um, barrier to. Uh, it's become a concern, increasingly more important concern to folks who are participating in volunteering. Um, do you have any uh, data? on the actuality of that. So essentially that fear is present, but were people actually citing things that happened or is it more this like ubiquitous kind of- No, it's um, real. It's Yeah, it, it's real. Uh, I don't have it in those slides, but we've asked about particular types of abuse or threats um, and they're, they're happening. Um, I, you know, Unfortunately, I'm hearing sort of the framing of we're waiting for what the next step is, which is sort of a suggestion of worry about violence going forward. Um, you know, and this is a, a, a I haven't had a, a way to access this from a data perspective, but I'm also there is this interesting dynamic, I believe, where um, it's not happening in voting areas where you would expect it in the sense that sort of safely red or blue areas um, might be where there's more sort of harassment. In more battleground places, it seems like it's less reported. Uh, and what I'm, what I would hypothesize there is that there's something going on in the messaging for sort of hyper partisans on both sides uh, that then leads to sort of more of this violation of norms or expectations in that space. Whereas a more balanced jurisdiction, folks are are not getting that messaging or at least not acting on it. Hmm. That's interesting. So um, just from my experience, my husband worked 10 different election events as a poll worker this past uh, election, and that was a concern of his. And then he was uh, pleasantly surprised. He was prepared, but pleasantly surprised to learn that it was a, a very, uh, not calm, but relatively tame compared to what you would expect in an election um, environment in Florida. So uh, that is interesting to know that it's more that it is happening in more like solidly red or blue areas. Yeah. And, and to the credit of local election officials, I've heard from a number who are proactively identifying folks who are 
maybe skeptics or vocal um, critics of the election process, and they're mm -hmm. inviting them to become participants, uh, oh, come in and help and volunteer. And that's working in some cases. It's a, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think of ways to how do you overcome yeah. that and motivate others. So cool. And for so long, elections were sort of a thing that we just took for granted. They work and they do work. They continue to work. But I don't think it's something that the public um, until really 2016 uh, realized sort of how many moving pieces there are um, and how it works. And so once you sort of daylight any of that for the public, then of course questions come. And so I think education and engagement is just so key at this point. Okay, cool. Hi there. Um, this is Dietrich Romero. I use he him pronouns. I'm a voter education and outreach specialist with the Office of the Secretary of State in Washington State. So I really enjoy the talk, but I'm also pretty new to the work. So I just started last year, uh, right around election time. And so I just wanted to say, again, thank you. But for those wanting to get involved too, um, apply to jobs. Um, <laughs> as Paul mentioned, there there's a, and a lot of people who are leaving the profession right now. And so um, to kind of respond to two of the things that have been brought up a little bit, one is that, yes, there are threats. Um, and that's actually part of what drew me to the work is that I sensed a need and I, I have a deep sense of public service. I have an MPA, it makes sense. Um, but the other piece is, yeah, just, just apply. So I spent five years in higher education in academic advising and um, likewise driven by a sense of service and, and that was my, my purpose driving me. And when I first thought, you know, maybe higher is, isn't for me and I searched for something else, there were two different elections positions I applied to. I got interviews for both, I got offers for both. The jobs are out there, look for them. You don't have to just volunteer. If this is your passion, jump in. <laughs> so. Deidre, thank you for that. I, I, I fully, yeah, you couldn't have said it better than anyone else. This is perfect. I, I'm in the middle of this process right now, uh, speaking with counties across Oregon and you're absolutely right. The positions are open. The candidate pools um, need you. Uh, so jump in and, and do that. And I'm um, excited to hear that uh, you made that switch over. I think actually the academic advising to voter education side is perfect, right? This is this is an engagement question and how to support people in being successful at the poll. So awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I come from a similar background. So I'm just thinking a lot of that would be very transferable for sure. And Dietrich, it looks like you unmuted to say something else. Uh, I was I was going to say I mean it's absolutely the case that it's it's very transferable and perhaps that's why I was hired to the position but um, I mean there's also a lot of people leaving higher ed right now so maybe we just need to do a big flip <laughs> <laughs> just reroute our do gooderism to something that actually matters I'm just a little jaded I work at an institution in Florida right now so <laughs> um, cool excellent other questions. I'm going to jump in sort of as a segue here to kind of what you um, were all just kind of talking about. So Dietrich may actually also have some insights here uh, because I, I noticed a number of your questions asked about uh, feeling whether or not the LEOs had enough resources and time and staff and all that good stuff to do the work that they need to do. And since prior to about 2016, you know, this sort of work really was kind of flying under the radar. So I'm guessing that kind of helped you know, keep a lot of those resources that were being allocated by their their uh, local, you know, funding agencies, whatever that was, county, township, and whatnot, kind of, you know, at a pretty steady level for a number of years. Are you, I mean, because I'm not sure if you ask a direct question on this or have a sense of this after having done the surveys, whether or not these local um, communities are maybe going to try to ramp up some of the financial and staffing resources to try to, you know, offset this feeling that they are currently aren't feeling like they have enough? Yeah, I, you know, we, we have some questions about funding and space. Actually, one of the really interesting ones to me is um, lack of space is a common concern. Um, so sort of the age of infrastructure and buildings, because now that elections are part of a critical infrastructure, sort of security questions are increasingly important. Uh, and so where to store, you know, especially with the shift to vote by mail, you now have more physical stuff to store that you didn't have previously. Uh, and depending on retention schedules, there's a federal rule on how long you keep ballots, but uh, litigation or other events can extend that. And so I've really heard storage space, right? That's a, a on a wish list for a lot of folks. Um, so your question on staffing, um, 
we've heard concerns about that. I think the big challenge is the way we fund elections is so diverse in the U.S. Um, some uh, some counties fund elections based on a set fee per type that the state gives to the local, and that's sort of what you do. Oregon, by law, general funds must support elections, but that's not really always how it happens. Uh, elections tend to be also in the office with the recorder where property transactions occur, and so fees can be balanced sort of across different branches within an office. And so I think that's a, a big piece. Another challenge we're also hearing nationally um, is that just the job title has been problematic in terms of hiring. So it might be um, represented as sort of like a clerical role. And so younger applicants are sort of issue, they're sort of interested in taking on that role where I've talked to some local election officials where they're changing, you know, you're an elections analyst, right? And so thinking about ways to sort of reframe that, um, but pay is also part of that challenge. So within jurisdictions, sometimes those clerk roles are a lower classification in the job system. And so the pay may be a dollar or two above minimum wage. Whereas really, you know, a frontline election worker is a constitutional law actor. <laughs> you know, they, they're deciding who has access to this. And so uh, they do a lot of interpretive work. And so trying to elevate also um, the, the, the sort of compensation and respect that goes with that position was also important as much as hiring more people. I've gotten very excited about job classification studies. I didn't expect that a few years ago. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is really cool. And that's a, that's an issue that uh, auditors face as well. So um, I think just thinking about how, do you, how you change the roles to uh, be uh, more marketable to Gen Z in particular uh, is is something that I think local government officials and employees need to think about in general because we're using a lot of old um, old terminology when to describe very dynamic and important processes in our governance systems. So yeah, yeah no, I think election science analyst one, right? That would be a nice. Uh... I'd like that. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Speaking well, of using old well. things, yeah. if I can jump in real quick. Yes. <laughs> uh, hi, Paul. It's Rebecca. Uh, nice to see you. It's been a while. Um, I, you know, my focus is technology, as you know, so I'm going to ask the technology question. With the kind of digital transformation that government in general is undergoing and the, uh, the move towards more um, access to service uh, sort of platforms and, and the incorporation of non-governmental actors into mm -hmm. the you know, technology space around maybe not necessarily the ballots themselves, but some of the collection, reading, storage methods, things like that. How has the shifting technology landscape uh, sort of impacted either the ability of uh, local election of officials to do their jobs or change the kinds of duties and tasks that they have related to technology mm -hmm. to support some of those uh, sorts of processes? That's a great question. It's actually one that I've got on my interview protocol right now uh, is sort of what are those interactions? So from our survey, you know, I, we've heard, uh, I think maybe something you would recognize, right? A mixed bag. On one hand, um, some of these technological tools have allowed for doing more with less staff, right? It's sort of voter registration management, especially in a automatic voter registration or online voter registration system is a lot less paper and it's sort of digital reviews that are quicker, which is great. Um, at the same time, the other dynamic, and this came up in our election audit study and it might speak more to some of the concerns you might know about, Rebecca, um, we had a spurt of database development post-2002 with Help America Votes Act. And so a number of states in the U.S. have voter registration databases that were built by a vendor. That vendor has now been sold three or four times. And the support to make modifications to that system is uh, pretty opaque. So the skill set from an IT perspective may not reside within the county office or even the state office in some places. Uh, some states actually, the way they wrote the contract for that database may not even have the right to modify it themselves. You know, the ownership of the of the database resides with the vendor. Um, so I think there are challenges there. And um, especially now with the critical infrastructure designation, I think some of the cybersecurity concerns, uh, we, we've been asking that question on our survey for a number of years, whether local election officials are participating in cybersecurity measures. And we're, we asked them about the best practices that CISA has identified from DHS. And a lot of them are saying they're not doing it, but they're not doing it because some other unit within the county or state government is doing it for them or they report. Um, and that gives me a little pause. You know, are we seeing 
uh, sort of responsibility for some of the cybersecurity components getting moved around different parts of the organization. Um, thankfully, when it comes to like voting machines, tabulations, those types of tools, those are devices that are, you know, they're totally separated from any connectivity, um, quite quite real, like they're all air blocks, right? So it's, you know, the data might be scanned and, and someone has to physically walk that memory stick over to work with it. So there's, those devices are removed. But I think the technology is like, in many cases, sort of this double-edged sword. One of the challenges too with that is, I think the training, well, two challenges, because we do local administration at such fine scale, you might find like that graphic I showed with the different counties and different technologies, you might have one state that's using three different systems. Um, and so from a training and support across each other, each jurisdiction, that's not automatically possible if I'm using some selection of technology and you're using something different. Uh, the second piece is sort of training opportunities. And I think, you know, unfortunately in local government, when budget cuts come, uh, training and travel uh, are part of that often. And so are we able to sort of keep the skill set in pace with those technologies we're adopting? Always fun things. Always good to have Rebecca asking our tech related questions because yeah. that's like way above my pay grade. <laughs> so I'm always glad to have her here to ask those questions. <laughs> well, we're getting close to the end of our time. I know some folks probably have other meetings and whatnot they need to get off to. So I just wanted to see if there's one last uh, round of questions, queries jokes, additional memes, anything else folks would like to share before we uh, set you back out into the world? All right. Seeing none, I think um, I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you so much to Paul Manson for being with us today. Um, really fantastic presentation. Just so much interesting stuff there. I'm going to be thinking about this all weekend now. <laughs> great. Awesome. Oh, happy to. Plus or minus. <laughs> great, great to be here. Great to see some familiar faces too. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Appreciate it. Thank you to everybody who's still here. And um, I'll be sending out sort of an email um, probably in the next couple of weeks to all at least all of the Cascade members um, with the uh, link to the video. So we'll, ha we'll have that up on our on our chapter um, YouTube page. So folks would like to see it. If they weren't able to be here today, um, then uh, they can still enjoy the fun and hear all the good stuff. Um, but um, I think with that, Diane, do you have any other closing thoughts? Just, uh, just want to extend my gratitude to everybody for taking time with us. And just once again, thank you, Paul, because yeah, I'm also going to be thinking about this. And I was already messaging my husband, like, there's so much to do. <laughs> <laughs> gotta get out there so um <laughs> thank you everybody and have a good rest Excellent. of your day and a right. great weekend if you get one of those <laughs> yes thanks everybody take care bye-bye thank now <laughs>